So we got an incredible chapter this week, a bunch of different content to go over and discuss. So same thing as my last review, I will put timestamps in this video for those who would like to navigate around topic to topic because yeah, I'm feeling this is going to be over 20 minutes long again. So I hope you enjoy as with all that being said, let's get straight into it. So the chapter starts off with the narrator stating that after Gojo entered an awakened state via hitting the two black flashes in his fight against Sukuna, he was able to establish a special pathway in retrieving his reverse curse technique back. This special pathway revolved around Gojo dispersing the technique's operation throughout separate regions of the brain. Now, if you're a bit confused on that, basically, in chapter 230, Sukuna explained how Gojo, when he got the nosebleed, was overstraining himself trying to use reverse curse technique to heal his burnt out curse technique, and that's because curse techniques are located in a specific area in the brain. They say it's in the right prefrontal cortex. It is also believed that while cursed energy flows from the stomach, positive energy, which is used to perform reverse curse technique, positive energy is directed from the sorcerer's brain. So what the narrator is explaining to us is that as a result of Gojo receiving the two black flash amps, he recovered his lost RCT output by spreading the usage and burden of the process throughout different areas in his brain. It's still a bit vague and maybe my interpretation is wrong, but I've read three different translations for this part, and all three seems to imply the same thing. Now, in a similar fashion, Sukuna could have also regenerated his arms when he landed the two black flashes earlier. However, it was Yuji's seven black flashes that stripped away that possibility from Sukuna to heal, because on top of those black flashes, Yuji was also doing soul damage. Now, I saw some people in the comments feeling bad for Megami, since they thought he took all the black flash damages with Sukuna, but in this chapter, it's revealed that Yuji struck directly at the boundary between Sukuna and Megami's soul. Sukuna confirmed to himself earlier in chapter 250. So every attack Yuji does to Sukuna, like the seven black flashes in the last chapter, Megami should still be fine. Moving on, the next page shows us a double spread of Sukuna unleashing his domain expansion. Now the narrator states how Sukuna's two black flash amps helped return his capability to use domain expansion again. But the condition, the way it works, the rules, hands signs, desperate summoning, and strength of the domain, it's different from the typical malevolent shrine that we're used to. However, all those details get explained in the second half of the chapter after the flashback segment, so we're not going to go into it yet. What we will go into right now is just discussing the design itself. This malevolent shrine appears a lot differently than previous showcasings. Now, it does state that the domain Sukuna unleashed was incomplete, so that could just be the one and only explanation for the different appearance here. However, in my opinion, with the few deformed faces, eyes, hands, Kenjaku merger-like ramifications, this almost looks too different to be an incomplete version of Malevolent Shrine. A Malevolent Shrine that never had those faces, eyes, or just all these weird aspects to begin with. So I wonder if there's something else on top of it being incomplete that makes the domain look so different. Maybe because Sukuna ingested Tengen's womb recently, it does sort of give me some Tengen merger vibes with the black tentacles and whatnot. I know this panel is just a concept of what the merger could look like, not what it actually looks like. Some people in the comments suggested that it could be a fusion of Megami's Chimero Shadow Garden, but I highly doubt it because the narrator implied that Gojo took away the 10 Shadows card from Sukuna, so Sukuna shouldn't be able to use the 10 Shadows anymore. And we also don't see any Shikigami during the sure hit attack sequence, it's just Sukuna slashes. Again, maybe I'm wrong, the one and only reason could just be due to the fact that it's incomplete and was summoned differently by Sukuna. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'll go more into it after covering the flashback because the next page shows us the crew discussing their preparations during the one month time skip. Akari mentions how it's crucial to have reverse curse technique and or an anti-domain technique for their upcoming fight against Sukuna. Chozo responds saying that he and Yuji can manage with reverse curse technique and Yuji is immediately confused oh. hearing this because at this point in time, Chozo Chozo did not know how to heal via using reverse curse technique yet, nor does Yuji understand why Chozo said they specifically can manage it. And this is when Chozo asks Hakari, Yuta, and Shoko, hey, I've always wondered, how do you guys compensate for your lost blood when regenerating with reverse curse technique? Hakari doesn't know and says he's on yeah. autopilot, which is funny because it's literally the truth, having an automatic reverse curse technique due to his infinite cursed energy jackpot reward. And Yuta also replies saying he doesn't know either 
either because he's a prodigy and can perform reverse curse technique instinctually. However, Shoko, the doctor of Jujutsu High, she gives a proper answer saying that she converts the curse energy into blood to make up for the blood loss. And that's when Chozo explains how his body has the <laughs> upper advantage in this case because the typical downside to using reverse curse technique is that it takes a lot of cursed energy. However, we learned in chapter 142 when Chozo fought Naoya that because Chozo is a death painting womb with mixed blood from cursed spirits and humans, Chozo carries a special constitution that allows him to convert his cursed energy into blood. Now, another person who also has the blood manipulation technique is Noritoshi Kamo. However, Kamo is different from Chozo in that he's not a death painting womb, so unfortunately, he can't convert his cursed energy into blood. And that's why we see Kamo carry like multiple IV bags in fights to use them as extra blood supply for his technique. But back to the main point, as long as Chozo has cursed energy, he won't die of blood loss. The same can be said the other way around. As long as Chozo has blood, he won't ever run out of cursed energy. And that's why he mentions Yuji here, because if Yuji eats the six remaining death painting wounds, which he already has, then not only would he gain the blood manipulation technique, but he would also gain the special properties that a death painting womb carries, the capability to convert your cursed energy into blood and vice versa. So Yuji and Chozo can basically use reverse cursed technique without ever thinking about expanding too much cursed energy or compensating the lost blood, but all they need to do is just learn how to use reverse cursed technique in general. It's like they got the hacks for the game, but don't have the game itself. Thus, why Chozo asks that he would like to do switch training with a person who can use reverse curse technique. And Yuji's like, huh? Switch training? That's when we get the reveal of Wee Wee's curse technique. Quote, my technique is the teleportation of targets. If I'm with you, I'm able to transport you to a place or person that I've previously marked. End quote. So if you watched my spoiler video, I was wondering how Wee Wee's technique could blend two different abilities together, teleportation and body swap. Because while a curse technique can have multiple abilities or extension techniques, they would still need to be related to the technique's main concept in general. And so in Wee Wee's case, teleportation is the main concept, but a body swap ability can derive from that since it's actually teleporting or transporting a target to another target. Now, after hearing how Wee Wee can swap the souls of two marked individuals, Yuji worries if the swapped souls would affect the body's shape as well, because due to his experience with Mahito's technique, once the shape of the soul is changed, the body would follow along with it. That's because Mahito's technique is centered around the belief that the soul came before the body. So for example, let's say if Panda swapped in Yuji's body, would Yuji's body become big like Panda since the body has to follow along with the soul's shape? And of course, I'm talking about Panda before he got small. Can Yaku's technique is also centered around the belief that the body and soul are one in the same. However, with Wee Wee's curse technique, it's believed that the soul and body are two separate entities. And this ties back to Kinjaku and Mahito's conversation in Shibuya, how one's own curse technique can dictate their worldviews and perspectives from others. So Wee Wee's curse technique doesn't have to follow the same rules or practices as Mahito's. He can swap souls without the bodies changing. Then suddenly, Sakabe asks, hey Yuji, the speed of your growth as a sorcerer has been tremendous. Do you know why that is? And I like how Yuji starts to blush from thinking that the answer is due to his own accord, but Kusakabe straight up says it's because of Sukuna. Bruh. Since Sukuna fought and used his curse technique in Yuji's body, Yuji's body should now remember using extreme special grade jujutsu. It's like if Prime Michael Jordan played basketball in your body for a day, and then you got your body back the next day, you would feel remnants of Michael Jordan skills resonating within you, maybe you would dribble the ball a lot better, shoot better, imitate his form, suddenly become faster than you were before. It's like muscle memory, pretty much. And yeah, I like how Yuji is annoyed hearing that Sukuna is the result of his insane growth. Kind of sucks to hear that the person you hate is the reason for your success. Anyways, Kusakabe suggests that Yuji should do switch training with him so that he can teach Yuji better cursed energy manipulation and a basic foundation to the simple domain barrier technique. Hakari brings up how 
there should be a binding vow preventing simple domains to be taught to outsiders of the new shadow school. And Mei Mei responds, don't worry, I've already taken care of that. She probably did some deal revolving around money exchange or something. The flashback ends with Wee Wee stating that the limit for swapping souls is twice per person, at least under a month of time. So the maximum number that Yuji swapped bodies with was at least two. Obviously, one was with Kusakabe to learn simple domain. The second switch had to either be with Yuta, Hakari, Shoko, or Gojo to learn reverse curse technique. So that fully explains why Yuji said to Sukuna that they cheated during the one month time skip. And I'm kind of glad that there's an explanation to Yuji learning reverse curse technique because before it was assumed by the majority that, oh, you know, Yuji always had the potential to grasp reverse curse technique because his flow and understanding of cursed energy had kept growing and growing over time. And it's not that I fully disagree with that. It was just the reveal still felt out of nowhere and kind of lazy that Yuji could just suddenly be capable of using reverse curse technique after the time skip and we didn't ever get to see the progression of him unlocking it. Although now that it's explained because Yuji switched bodies with an RCT user courtesy of Weewee's curse technique, yeah, it makes a lot more sense and as ironic as this may sound, I feel like the crew cheating was a better idea and execution for preparing their fight against Sukuna. Heck, I'd cheat too if I was fighting the king of curses. But going back to the present time, Yuji uses his new shadow style simple domain to counter Sukuna's malevolent shrine. In the process, he also notices that the domain is incomplete, and the narrator confirms that thought, saying Yuji's notion is correct. And this is where the translation disparity kicks in, because in the next page, if you read the TCB translations, it tells you that the malevolent shrine Sukuna just unleashed was a closed barrier type, the type that's found common in most other domains. However, if you read the Viz or Kaizen backup translations, it tells you that Sukuna unleashed an open barrier type instead, just like the one he did in Shibuya. This is correct for three reasons. One, we don't see a closed shell surrounding the landscape. The slashes and damages that are happening, they are affecting the real world, not in the user's own materialized environment. Two, the narrator says that the range of Sukuna's domain is the same range displayed in Shibuya. So this can't be a closed barrier because otherwise the range would be a lot smaller since the purpose of having an open barrier is that there is an escape route for your opponent to well escape. But the trade-off for allowing that escape route is increasing the size of your own domain, which is again what Sukuna did in here and in Shibuya. The third and last reason is that Maki wouldn't automatically be trapped in a closed barrier because as stated in chapter 198, her heavenly restriction gives her the opportunity to decide whether she chooses to enter a domain's barrier or stay out of it. However, if it's an open shell with no barrier like Sukuna's, then Maki doesn't have that choice anymore. This is what we see in this chapter as Maki is automatically pulled into Sukuna's domain, so this has to be an open barrier type. Now, normally Maki would be fine regardless because most domain sure hits, they target those with cursed energy. And since Maki has no cursed energy, she would be immune or invisible to the attacks. However, Malevolent Shrine is special in that the sure hit targets anything with and without cursed energy. So even if an apartment building or a large statue has no cursed energy, as long as it's in the domain's range, it's going to get cut. Maki is no exception to this. Now, due to Sukuna obviously being in a weakened state, soul damage, no reverse curse technique, has two broken arms, a fraction of his brain still being fried from Gojo's infinite void, well, the two black flash amps that he landed earlier, along with altering his hand sign and making impromptu binding vows, it helped and allowed Sukuna to force out an incomplete malevolent shrine. Quite the desperate summoning for the King of Curses. Now, as someone in the comments pointed out, this different hand sign Sukuna used is seemingly Gojo's Indra hand sign when he unleashes his infinite void. The reason Sukuna had to change it is because the original malevolent shrine usually requires both the left and right arm. However, Sukuna only has two right arms and zero left arms at the moment, so he had to 
copy Gojo's one-handed signature, but as for how Sukuna made Gojo's Indra sign to work for his domain, this could have been one of the impromptu binding vows mentioned. So, okay, in exchange for some restriction or limitation that he put on himself, it's not revealed in this chapter, but Sukuna must have sacrificed something to make sure that Gojo's hand seal would work for casting this malevolent shrine. Some of you might think that the trade-off was so Sukuna could only keep his domain active for 99 seconds. And while that could be the restriction, I feel like the 99 seconds is a separate result to the domain just being incomplete because of Sukuna's weakened state. Not that the 99 seconds is an actual trade-off for the Binding Vow. To be honest, I kind of wished Gege would just reveal the sacrificial details of most Binding Vows like right away. At least ones made with yourselves. Because the one for how Sukuna killed Gojo without chanting the world slash incantations, I don't think it was a good idea for Gege to not reveal the binding vow details until like 10 plus chapters later, especially for a huge moment like that. I mean, if we learn the restriction that Sukuna placed on himself in the next chapter to do the one-handed seal, then that's awesome. I'm just kind of scared if we don't get that detail or even if it's revealed late because revealing binding vow conditions late, it would make binding vows seem like an ass pull for the moment it was used. In some cases, it doesn't matter. Like, for example, Miwa increasing this one single attack against Kenjaku in exchange for never being able to swing her sword again. Even if that was revealed to be a binding vow 100 chapters later, that's fine because the result is that she still lost to Kenjaku since he's much more superior than her in strength. But binding vows that result in the character's victory or resulting in huge benefits like the way Sukuna uses them, then I think it's very important to reveal the sacrifices of what was lost or restricted immediately. That's just my opinion though, so fingers crossed, hopefully we get it next chapter. Unless again, maybe the 99 seconds is the trade-off, but I don't think it is. Moving on though, we see the squad trying to endure Sukuna's sure hit for 99 seconds. It's actually quite impressive that their simple domain could withstand most of the shrine's duration. Shout out to the user Maidenless for informing me that Miwa came in here and used her simple domain to protect Maki. First time Miwa is on the battlefield and I think it's pretty cool how she kind of got her get back with Maki, losing to her in the goodwill event, and now seen shielding her with the simple domain. But like I said earlier, Yuji's simple domain endured most of the shrine's duration. The last few seconds broke his simple domain and sliced off his leg. Although, now that he has the same blood manipulation properties as Chozo, Yuji awesomely reattaches his leg back. But this chapter ends with a parallel to the Sukuna versus Maharaga fight. After Sukuna's domain is done, he then chants Furnace open and the burning flames finally return after four long years. Okay, so I know there's going to be comments saying that the initial Crunchyroll subtitles were right, translating malevolent kitchen, and yeah, that's because Mizushi, which is what Sukuna says in Japanese, that can translate to either shrine or kitchen, but the fact that he's opening or turning on a furnace, then it's basically confirmed at this point that Sukuna's entire technique is based on cooking. Cleave and dismantles representing kitchen knives to cut things, and the flames representing a furnace to cook or heat the food. It also ties into his chef-like theme throughout the entire story. Satoru Gojo was described to be like a fish on Sukuna's chopping board. He also cut Mimiko into like mince pieces. He keeps Uraume around for their freezing ability curse technique. And don't forget about his whole cannibalistic nature. I mean, Sukuna literally ate his twin in the womb, so he was like destined to be this way since birth. However, the more interesting part that stems from this cooking confirmation is Yuji's potential with the technique. Since Sukuna said himself that cursed techniques can change and evolve over time depending on the era and the user themselves. One of the main reasons we saw Yuji's cleave to have a scissor cutout display is because scissors are a modern kitchen tool to cut things. So with that in 
mind, it's possible that Yuji could obtain more abilities than Sukuna because having the more modern technique means there's more evolved tools that existed over time. For example, what if Yuji can also bring out the flames, but instead of saying furnace like Sukuna because that's more old style, he says stove or microwave open and hey, a microwave would also unleash radiation. Oh my god, what if Yuji can also have a freezing ability? Because think about it, Sukuna, he keeps Uraume around since back then fridges and or freezers didn't exist. So he took in Uraume for the purpose of freezing his food. But Yuji, because he's a modern shrine user, what if he says, and this is going to sound very silly, but what if one day Yuji can say fridge open and he's got a cooling or an ice freezing ability? What if he could unleash a huge tidal wave by saying dishwasher or sink open? Okay, maybe I'm getting too ahead of myself, though seriously, I am curious to see how far Gege is willing to go with the whole curse techniques evolving and changing in different eras, because this has also been explained before with Naobito's projection sorcery technique, and I feel like Yuji and Sukuna having a cook-off would be wild. Obviously, I don't think Yuji can even open other assets in his kitchen yet, like how Sukuna can open his furnace. It'll probably take some time for him and, you know, some experience to grow out the potential of the shrine technique, unless maybe you think that Yuji will just stick around with the cutting and only unlock up to that. But now that I know other possibilities exist, then I'm kind of hoping he can do more than just cut. But let me know what you guys think about this in the comments and let me know your thoughts on the chapter. Lots of great topics that were discussed. Unfortunately, there will be a break next week, but don't worry because I will hopefully get a video out during the break week just to fill that empty JJK void. Though, if you enjoyed this video, I would kindly appreciate it if you can drop a like. It would help me out a ton. As with all that being said, thank you so much for watching my weekly JJK chapter reviews and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.